Okay. Uh, my name is Ryan Ahmed. Um, right now I'm a high school student in, in New York City. And my family background is one that comes from uh, immigrant parents who came into this country um, at the ages of at the ages of twelve and also twenty, um, my dad came in when he was in, when he uh, entered middle school. My mom came in uh, going into college, and they both came from Bangladesh. Alaikum. Thank you so much. So, uh, are they from Dhaka or from Silet? There. Okay, my mom is from Dhaka and my dad is from Silet. That's not bad, is it? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, most most of the uh, we've got a very big Bangladeshi community in Birmingham, and they're overwhelmingly wow. from Silet. Wow, uh, I I actually did not know that at all. That's so yeah. that's so nice to hear. I, I call Silet the land of the rivers. Yeah. So just to get started, um, I've really read about your work, and it's really interesting to see that. Uh, the gangs in Birmingham has been brought to light uh, with that with the show of Peaky Blinders, and it's really interesting to see how young people like me have been able to start lo start looking at your own work uh, by having these characters uh, be brought to life. I know that um, I know that a few characters were actually real, uh, some weren't, but I feel like. Uh, I actually wanted to know what you feel is true, depicted as true, and what you feel like um, is not. So let me answer that in several ways. First of all, I have had no involvement at all with the series. Secondly, the series has been excellent for Birmingham, my city, because it's drawn a lot of positive attention to Birmingham, despite it being uh, a series about gangsterism it's attracted a worldwide audience and that means a lot of people have wanted to come to Birmingham. It's also, as a result, given me an opportunity to write about the real story. So those are the positives of the series. Very important for Birmingham and also it's, it's affected me personally. Coming to the question about the reality, the series is very different to the reality. There is obviously for many years there's been a tendency to glamorize gangsterism and to associate with mafia style tropes so you have the the don in this case tommy shelby a flawed character but very attractive despite all his flaws who has some positive qualities and he's dominated by his love of his family despite his violence and his criminality and that fits into a lot of the mafia style tropes that the mafia don is kind to children, looks after the elderly, respects women. What they don't tell you is that these people prey upon their own. And the real Peaky Blinders had nothing in common with the organized glamorous gangster gang that we see in the series. First of all, the series is set in the 20s. There were no Peaky Blinders in Birmingham in the 20s. There were men who had been Peaky Blinders, some of whom were involved in one of England's first major organised gangs called the Birmingham Gang. But mostly the former Peaky Blinders were either killed in the First World War, came back changed men and were ageing. So first of all, there were no Peaky Blinders in the 20s. Secondly, there was very little gang problem in Birmingham in the 20s. That was a remarkable turnaround, Ryan, because in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Birmingham was one of the most infamous cities in England for gang violence. Thirdly, there wasn't just one Peaky Blinder gang, as is suggested in the series. There were numerous gangs of men who were known as Peaky Blinders. So the term Peaky Blinder, Ryan, is a generic term for the hooligans of Birmingham. In Manchester and Salford, these backstreet gangs are called Scotlers. For, in London from 1898, they were known as hooligans. In Birmingham, they were originally called sluggers, later known as Peaky Blinders. The terms become interchangeable. And fourthly, the term Peaky Blinder has nothing to do with the false notion that there were disposable safety razor blades stitched into the peak of the cap, which was flicked off in a, in a fight, slashed across the forehead of the enemy, hence causing blood to go in their eyes and blind them. 
the real Peaky Blinders were named after a fashion. Well, I, I did not know uh, much of that and bringing that to light is really amazing. And seeing that this show has done a huge impact on the uh, city is really interesting to see how millions of viewers uh, are really interested, are actually visiting. And I feel like it's a wonderful thing to have a show make an impact on communities. Um, and yeah, I know that you've, I believe that you've spoken with uh, the descendants of uh, Billy Kimber. Uh, what legacy do you think the descendants of the post-war uh, Birmingham gangs have left based on learning from the trouble stories of their ancestors? Okay, so Billy Kimber in the series is portrayed as a major London gang box controlling a major London gang boss controlling the protection rackets, etc., on the race courses. In reality, Billy Kimber was a Brummie, not a Londoner. And he wasn't small like shown in the series, he was a big, burly Brummie. He came from a very tough neighbourhood called Summer Lane, not Small Heath. That's another uh, difference to the series where the gang's based in one district. It wasn't from Small Heath. There were Peaky Blinders in and around Small Heath, but there were Peaky Blinders in and around all of Birmingham's older, tougher, poorer, working class neighbourhoods. Billy Kimber came from the Summer Lane neighbourhood, north of Birmingham. He was a Peaky Blinder, but he moved very quickly into pickpocketing in a small gang with his brother and others on racecourses. Why did they do that? Because racecourses were free to all, free for alls. There was very little control on racecourses. Gangs could operate almost with impunity. There were a few policemen, but they tended to take bribes. There was no real race course supervision. So Billy Kimber was one of, led a gang of one of number of small gangs from Birmingham who collectively were known as the Brummagem Boys. There were other little gangs from elsewhere, but the Brummagem Boys were the most vicious, violent and frightening of the race course rogues. Billy Kimber brings that Brummagem Boy collection conglomerate into a slightly more ordered groupie and he moves to london and he abandons his birmingham wife maud to live and die in poverty he abandoned his two children with maud to live in poverty their descendants have been in touch with me and they're very angry still with billy kimber and aggrieved at the way their great grandmother their great grandmother was treated because kimber eventually became one of England's most successful gangsters. He moved away from gangsterism in, after 1921. He eventually became a legitimate bookmaker and he lived in very affluent circumstances in Torquay on the south coast of England, known as English Riviera. He took his second wife and his two children by his second wife on long cruises to places like South Africa, which would have cost a fortune. His two daughters by his second wife uh, went to finishing school in Switzerland and had ponies. So they had a very different experience to the two daughters and their descendants in Birmingham. So there is still a lot of anger amongst Billy Kimber's Birmingham descendants. His descendants from his second marriage, uh, one or two of them have been kind of been in touch with me, but the older ones want nothing to do with it because they're, they're, they're embarrassed and ashamed of how they became a wealthy family. Wow. Uh, what impacts does Birmingham's past, especially with gang activity, make on its present time? Very good question. I go out to a lot of schools giving talks because it's really important to get across that the series is drama. It's not reality. Because there is a tendency uh, uh, amongst a lot of lads, especially, in tougher working class neighborhoods to be drawn in by what they think is the glamour of gangsterism. And unfortunately, in too many parts of big cities like Birmingham and I presume New York, in some areas, the only men that have got wealth, have got fast cars, got all the bling, are the drug dealers, gangsters. And so I want to get across a very important message that gangsterism is not glamorous. Yes, enjoy the series, but it is not reality. The reality was vicious, vile, horrible men who preyed upon the weak and poor in their own neighbourhoods, who viciously attacked policemen, and who beat their wives up. 
one of whom was my great grandfather, Edward Derrick, a nasty, horrible man who had convictions for knifing, attacking the police, attacking other people, but also smashing it up his home. Uh, and he was a horrible, nasty wife beater. His older brother, John, my great grandfather was Edward Derrick. His older brother, John, was the leader of the local slogging gang, the forerunners of Peaky Blinders in Sparkbrook. So I have a reality in my family that is not something to be proud of, but it's something that is part of my heritage, unfortunately. And it's something that I need to share because if I'm writing about the misdeeds of other people's ancestors, it's only right that I write about the misdeeds of my own ancestors. Yeah, so that transitions perfectly to my next question, which is how has your own uh, ancestry impacted you today? My ancestry has impacted me massively. I grew up well off. My dad was an illegal bookmaker, then a legal bookmaker. But both my mum and dad were from the back streets. Mum was from Aston, a very tough neighbourhood. My dad was from Sparkbrook, another tough street. My mum and dad were very proud of their back streets origins. And the streets they came from were very, although poor, were very tightly knit. In my mum's street, all of her, most of her aunts and uncles lived there. Her great her granny and granddad lived there. She had lots of cousins. In my dad's street, the families were intermarried. We, my family was intermarried, the chins with other families. Growing up, <clears throat> I was fortunate that I didn't live in poverty, that we grew up well off. But my mum and dad were very proud to be working class. And as I mentioned, backstreet kids. And they drilled it into me to realise how fortunate I was to have an opportunity to have an education. I'm sure your mum and dad do the same to you. The chance you've got... I'm the first one in my family, Ryan, to go past 15 at school. First one to have a university education. The first one to have that opportunity. But mum and dad's families were very tough, uh, very strong, could fight when they had to, were not bullies, but they were talkers as well. And whenever there was a family gathering, which was regularly, they would talk about what Brummies called the old end, where they came from, the streets they belonged to. And so I grew up very much aware of my background, aware of my fortunate circumstances, aware of the debt I owed to those that came before, and also engrossed by family stories. So my ancestry is what's made me a historian, a social historian. I'm coming to... Another aspect of my family history, mum's family were all factory workers. Dad's family, my granddad, Chin, my dad, were illegal bookmakers. It was against the law to have a bet for cash on horse racing or dog racing away from the race course until 1961. Granddad started up in 1922. I worked in the betting shops when it was legal from the age of 13, part-time, but also full-time, until we sold up in 84. So I used to meet lots of what we used to call punters, customers, who knew my great-granny and granddad who were good friends of my granddad, who remembered Sparkbrook uh, when they were younger. So I got those stories as well. And so I've got a very unusual background for an academic, uh, that I've got a very strong working class roots. I know where I come from. I know the people to whom I belong. And so for me, without my family, I would not be a social historian. Regarding Edward Derrick, I knew about him growing up. I never met him. He died in uh, mid early 60s. Uh, one of my dad's brothers had met him. I didn't know that two years later. But we knew of him growing up. We knew that he was a wife beater. We knew that he was violent. And we knew that he'd abandoned my, my great grandmother. But I didn't quite realise he was a peaky blind until about 15 years ago when the West Midlands Police Museum uh, was started to digitise photos and I was a big supporter of the West Midlands Police Museum. And Dave Cross, the curator, called me in one day and said, Carl, look at this. Is this your great-grandfather? And I went, yes. And it was uh, two photos of him, which I've got in my, my first book, two photos of him. And he was, he's, he's got the hairstyle of the Peaky Blinder, the later Peaky Blinders, and it parted at the front. But he's got the, what they call the daff, uh, the, the muffler, like a scarf wrapped around the neck on one of the photos as well. So I knew about him growing up. I'd heard stories about him growing up, about him being a petty thief and a wife beater, but I didn't realise he was a peaky blind. It's about 15 or 20 years ago, well before the series. Yeah, and I first uh, wrote about the peaky blinders in my doctoral thesis. 
So in, in the early 80s, I was writing about the Peaky Blinders. I first wrote about Billy Kimber. Remember the Italian gangster in the series, Darby Sabini, Alfie yes, Solomons. Yes. His real name is Alfie Solomon. How do I know that? I interviewed Alfie Solomon's real brother, his younger brother in 1987. I interviewed the son of Darby Sabini's main right-hand man in 1987. I, I, so my interest in the gangs, my interest in the Peaky Blinders goes back to the 1980s. That's so interesting. Um, how has this all been a, some, uh, a motivation towards studying the past? And do you hope that studying the past helps to create a better future, through especially your work in learning about inequalities and discrimination? I think you're really, that's a really important point. I wish that politicians who blather on about the past, but just use it to pick out what they want to prove that they're right, would actually talk to social historians and learn. Because there's no exact lessons from the past, Ryan, because the context of time and place changes. But there are guidelines that the past reaches out to us with. If we would only look at them, listen and think about them. So first of all, inequality. What angers me is in modern Birmingham and in modern England, I'm sure it's the same in New York, the absolute poverty is reduced. But the relative gap between the better off and the poor in big cities like Birmingham, which is wide now, Ryan, as it was 100 years ago, I find that astonishing and appalling. So for me, looking at the past is about emphasising inequalities, bringing them to light, but also setting challenges to modern society. I'll give an example. The other week, I write for the local newspaper in Birmingham, the Birmingham Mail. And I did a piece about, a historical piece about child poverty in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. But then I finished off with a contemporary comparison that today in Birmingham, a third of our children, a third of our children are living in poverty. I find that shameful, Ryan that a hundred years after there were investigations into child poverty in Birmingham, 125 years after there is still child poverty, it's still rampant in our city. So yes, we must look at the past. We must understand the past. We can't bring exact lessons forward because as I said, the context changes, but there are strong guidelines from the past that should be informing us when we challenge inequality when we challenge racism, when we challenge prejudice, whether it be class-based prejudice, racial prejudice, homophobia, misogyny, accent prejudice. I face prejudice about my accent in, in England because I've got a strong brummy accent. People don't think I could be a doctor or professor. So it's this, it's this horrible negativity that we should be fighting against. I've definitely learned a lot from just the last few minutes. And I also wanted to ask what lessons from the past do you hope the youth of today, such as myself, take away from learning about our history from around the world? I think it's really important that, that's one of the reasons why I asked you about your own background, Ryan. I wanted to be able to respect your background because I know you know a lot about mine because of your research, but I wanted to be able to show you respect and I want to make sure I was doing it correctly. I think it's really important that we celebrate our diversity, but we should also be celebrating that which we have in common. You, as the son of Bangladeshi immigrants to New York, are a Bangladeshi New Yorker. You are American with Bangladeshi heritage. That's something that should be cherished. You can be proud of your roots in Bangladesh, but you also can be proud of being an American citizen. Now, that's something we must learn to understand. And sadly, there are too many people in politics, and I'm not going to name the one in America who has led to a lot of this rampant racism, but who think that the only Americans should be white Americans. And that's the same in England. Some people think the only English people can be white. Well, my city has been enriched by people from Jamaica and Barbados, from Bangladesh, from Gujarat in India, from Punjab in India, from Kashmir in as had Kashmir in Pakistan, from various parts of the world, from Cyprus and Poland. Now, what we should be doing is saying, yes, I think we can go too far just focusing on diversity or too far the other way, focusing on unity. It's about both. 
So I give a talk called Many People's One Birmingham. Let's be proud of who we are separately, but let's be proud of who we are together. Wow, it has been an honor to be able to speak with you. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity well, and for answering all my questions.